I'm just going to speak for exactly 10 minutes, so at least you know when it's going to be over. Uh, and I've only got three pictures for you. These pictures come from a book I've just finished called All That Is Solid, which hopefully will come out in February. And it's about the current situation in, in wealth and housing and money in this country. So that's what I've been quietly worrying about for the last year. I've been asked to talk about wealth discrepancies. And in, I think in the current context, uh, discrepancy is, is a very odd word, really, for where we are currently at. But it kind of shows the politeness that we now have over what you allow to, to call the huge inequalities that we've, we've now <coughs> got to, which Anne is right, they're not yet as great as they were in the 19th century or at the peak, which was probably 1913. But that is the direction in, in which we are currently heading. Uh, I'm a geographer. Uh, geography is an extremely broad church. Uh, Ashamin is, is a geographer who talks about people bumping into each other. Uh, I think you had Paul Chatterton this morning, um, who's a geographer trying to build new utopias. And at the other extreme of geography, can anybody guess what the most likely occupation for a geography undergraduate is to gain? Banker. Oh, banker, banker. We, we produce the bankers. Uh, and we don't teach our students that well how to add up. Um, but if any of you are feeling uh, slightly concerned about the fact that you might be people who, if you're architects, who are serving people with lots of money, as a geographer, you can feel even worse in that you are helping to create a few people who end up actually building up wealth inequalities. True, yes? It's true. 8%. Very, very serious accusation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 8%. I won't put my discipline down any further, save to say we're kind of the favourite discipline of all family. Um, when they can't do fine art. Um, and this links to one other thing I wanted to talk about today, uh, which is elitism. And um, particularly given that the Mayor of London has helpfully helped us into this particular discussion about elitism, and a way of looking at society that I think is commonly held by people at the top. It's just that most of them know not to say it. Uh, Nick Clegg, was it today? Nick Clegg got very angry at Boris today because he called his, his words about the 2% being geniuses and 16% basically being subnormal. He called it careless elitism, which suggested to me that careful elitism is that you don't tell the lower orders that you think they're trash um, and you'd be nice to them because you need their votes and so on. But really, society is about the 2%. And although this may sound a bit trite, when you look at how people are housed, or you look at how much wealth they've got, or you look at how much effort is put into the architecture of their homes, then there's certainly a lot more money spent on the homes in the time of the 2% that Boris was talking about than the 16% that he thought we were wasting our time over. My first image. If you've got very good eyesight, you'll see that that's a free car, car garage. The building on the left, the, the wing on the left of the house with those lovely windows, are windows for a car, or three cars to look out from and to use. I, I think of this particular residential home as the architecture of the financial crash. Uh, the floor pl plan appeared for the first time in a book published by Robert Frank, who's an economist in the US, who gave a lecture in 2001 about the problems of the middle class in America and how the middle class were constantly trying to buy their way up to better areas, to safer schools, to bigger houses, and everybody else was following them. And this was going to lead to trouble. Uh, Robert Frank was far from an extreme left-wing economist. Robert Frank was the co-author with Ben Bernanke of the major economic textbooks that sell the best in the United States. So at the top of American society, before the crash, people were well aware of the direction in which they were going and what was happening if people do start to think that they need homes like that and wings for their cars like that. But they didn't know what to do about it. They didn't know how to stop it. But they were aware it was happening. My second image for you 
is the skyscrapers. Um, this is the number of buildings that have been built a year and are still standing that are over 256 metres tall in the world. Um, simply got the data together, turned it sideways and had a look. The remarkable thing about it is that in the last three years we've built I think as many buildings worldwide that are this tall as in the last 30 years beforehand. This graph is remarkably remarkably similar to a very iconic graph that I'm sure must be known here about the building of buildings over 70 metres high in New York which happened at exactly the same kind of rate and acceleration except this date rather than being 2013 at the end was 1933 and after 1933 it collapsed people didn't build any more because of the crash in 1929 Things were still being built in 1930, 31, 32 that had been funded in 1929. But then that ended. And that building of skyscrapers in New, in New York was seen as a kind of egotistic thing that the elite had got involved in. It didn't make as much sense. Built up again. We had the boom in skyscrapers in the 70s. It came down with a crash in the 70s, up again in the 80s, down again, up again, and so on. There's absolutely no guarantee that this worldwide trend is going to crash like New York crashed in 1933. Um, but it's just worth being aware that the last three years are so completely different worldwide to what's gone before. And if you look at the wealth of the world's super rich, of which there's enormous attention in, of the wealth of the super rich in the world, people are very, very interested in it and in what proportion of it is held in treasure islands. Um, places that it can't be touched. And it, I'll say one, one other thing worth saying about that. There is now a definition of treasure islands, of what constitutes being the Cayman Islands and so on. And that definition includes the city of London as a treasure island to hide the wealth of the super rich in the moment. Um, worldwide, if we carry on having a tiny proportion of people holding more and more of the world's wealth, you're likely to see more vanity projects, I think, occur. But whenever we've got to this point before, whether it's been within a country or more generally, it hasn't been possible to sustain it. And I think it's, it's worth holding on to that. The other thing worth saying, I could have put a very positive graph up here at the same time as, as you see the skyscrapers rising, or if I'd shown it the proportion of the world's wealth held, held by the richest people going up and up. If you look at, say, the saddest statistic in the world, which is the number of babies that die in their first year of life. I think it's the saddest stat. Uh, two years ago, we had the biggest improvement in that that had ever occurred worldwide, a 5% drop in infant mortality in just one year, as far as we can tell. So there are lots of things getting better worldwide, at the same time as a small group are getting greedier. And again, if you want to do a historical analogy, if we were to go back and look at the excesses of 1929, of the 30s and so on. At the same time, as the rich were getting richer, as the big servant houses were getting more powerful in this city, in this country, infant health was improving, sanitation was improving, and other things were improving. So it's not a simple story of everything moving in one direction. My last image. This, Im this image is of Britain. If you've got good eyesight, you'll see that in the middle we've got London. And around the edge, we've got Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Bristol, Leeds, Reading, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Sheffield, Portsmouth, Bournemouth, Liverpool, and so on. And it's the country with area shown in proportion to the value of residential dwellings. This is now the large majority of our national wealth is held in residential dwellings. The second proportion is held in our pension schemes, and that's getting smaller. The amount of people who have private pensions is at a, I think it's an all-time low since it was first counted in the 1950s. Increasingly, this is seen as many people's pension, this housing wealth. And that bubble in the middle, that's about two years out of date. On a good month or a bad month, depending on how you see it, <laughs> that can expand by 10% if the supposed value of London residential property rises by 
If you read, I think it was page three of The Guardian today, you would think it's gone up by 2%, because that's what the nation might <coughs> say today. If you got to about page 30 and read the Land Registry report, you'd think it's gone down by 0.2%, uh, because the Land Registry say the value's gone down. We have very, very little idea of just what is holding that up. And that is vital to what happens in this country. That is why people from India and from Ireland, just a few people from Ireland now, and people from Greece and people from China and people from Russia, a thousand millionaires from Russia have bought into London. It's not just that they think we won't change our property laws or that we won't suddenly introduce a decent land value tax the day after the election, which is my personal fantasy. Um, I mean, what would you do if you were the Chancellor and you were in a bankrupt country the day after that election in May 2015? That, that is holding everything together. And that is based on those properties in Kensington and Chelsea, which are now becoming more and more empty, being worth more than if they were painted in a layer of paint, which I now think would be over two millimetres thick, made of gold. That, that is the point we are getting to. And it is highly, highly precarious. The Governor of the Bank of England, the new Governor of the Bank of England, almost unilaterally announced the almost immediate end of one particular underwriting scheme in the last 24 hours because he's worried about a bubble forming and landlords essentially outbidding everybody else. I agree with Anne that private renting, more private renting would be good, but it has to be the right kind of private renting. And what we're getting now is the wrong kind of private renting. What we're getting now is landlords being able to outbid almost anybody and one in four children in Britain as a whole, let alone in London, one in four children now living in private rented housing, in London, according to some statistics, having to move once every year, which means changing schools often every year and losing all your friends every year. And this is a particular madness and something which is very, very recent that, again, I, I think can't carry on. Let me end on two positive notes for you about wealth. We became dramatically more unequal in the 1980s in terms of wealth and income. Our incomes all pulled apart. But something remarkable happened since 1991, which the IFS have only recently published and hasn't generally been understood. Since 1991, we haven't been becoming more unequal. We've actually seen a slight reduction in income inequalities since 1991, for a long time, as long as you ignore the 1%. 99% of us have seen the gaps between our incomes narrow ever so slightly, but 1% have moved away so far that the overall statistics on income inequality keep on widening. That means that if you're in the 2% or the 3%, and if you want to know exactly what this means, you're in the 1%, if your income as a couple is 160,000 a year, and you've got no kids. If you're below 160,000 a year, or you've got kids and only 200,000 a year, you're with us. You're all together. If what's happening is not in the interest of the 2% and the 3% and the 4%, it's very, very hard to sustain. And the last thing to say about Switzerland, and it, I mean, it comes to something when you have to look to Switzerland and to Swiss bankers as a model, but. But we have to, um, because it's the nearest thing to us that's better uh, than us. The 1% in Switzerland take home half as much in pay as the 1% in Britain and still manage to run a fairly effective banking system. This is going to be realised at some point, but to realise all these things, you have to get it out of your head that only 2% of people are geniuses. You have to shake the packet of cornflakes to find them out and the rest at the bottom are scum. That way of thinking is stopping us moving forward. The question is, how long will it take for enough people in the elite to stop believing the things that they quietly believe in private and to start confronting the more vicious people in the elite who think, we just have to let a few wealthy people get very, very wealthy and we'll live off the crumbs from them. Thank you very much. <laughs>